Hi, my name is Jay Only, and my partner and I, Jordan McNamara, will be interviewing World War II veteran Leslie William Kick. Today is uh, November 3rd, and this is at the RFA Library. Uh, what is your full name? Leslie William Kick. And uh, where and when were you born? Pardon? Where and when were you born? I was born in Auburn, New York. Uh, March 13, 1920. 1920. Uh, did you go to college? Yes. I went to college from 45 to 49. Class of 49 and what is now ESF. Used to be the State College of Forestry. Uh, That's in Syracuse? Syracuse. Syracuse. At Syracuse University. Uh, did you have an occupation before you enlisted? Farm boy. Farm boy, huh? <laughs> That's good. Um, so when did you enter the service? Uh, May 3rd, 1938. Uh, were you enlisted or did, or did they draft you? I was enlisted. You enlisted? Was never drafted, no. Um, now were any of your high school friends and family enlisting also the same time you were? Pardon? Were, when you got enlisted, were any of your friends or family also enlisting too? No. No? Uh, no. Um, so, uh, okay, and what branch did you serve? I enlisted in the infantry, but giving a aptitude test, they put me in the signal corps. The signal corps? Um, okay, so where did you go for your basic training? Uh, in the signal corps, I went to the signal corps school, and they gave me a rudimentary basic, uh -huh. and uh, was in school for four or five months and left in November 38 and went to Panama. Okay, so where were you before Panama, you said? Pardon? Where were you for the basic training before Panama? Uh, Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. Uh, how hard was this training? The basic was rudimentary. Really? Uh, mainly it was the Signal Corps school there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was kind of an abbreviated course before I went to Panama, about four or five months. Mm -hmm. But it was very complete, and I had good aptitude for Morse code. So that was my main forte. That was your main forte, huh? So that's what you were specifically trained for, was the Morse code? After, after you had, after they found out you had such a skill at that, that's what you were you focused on and were trained for, the Morse code? Yeah, but I was schooled in all of the current communications at that time, both uh -huh. wire and radio. Okay. Um, after you arrived at Fort De Lesseps in Czechoslovakia in November of 1938, uh, how did it feel when you were reduced from sergeant to private? Uh, well, I expected it because you couldn't carry a buck sergeant back to the States. Oh, really? Oh. You had to be at least staffed to carry it back. Uh -huh. But as soon as I got to the States, they gave me a, a specialist rating which equaled the pay of sergeants, so it was no big problem. Oh, so there are a lot of other people that had this, that did this to them? Was the infantry basic training at Camp Croft in South Carolina, was that much different from the training you got for the Signal Corps? Oh, much different. Much different? Much more. That was complete, complete basic. So, so it was just basic? Was it? Yeah. Was but even cool? then, they, uh, the last week or two went back into communications because of my previous communications training. Mm -hmm. And then when I was, I went to jump school in September 1942 in Fort Benning, Georgia. Got out in October, the October 10th is the date I have for finishing jump school. And then they sent me to, right there, to two weeks, what they called the uh, Parachute Communications, 
which included two more parachute jumps with fuel problems. And then I was assigned to the 82nd Airborne. Uh -huh. And up to then I was still infantry. But they needed communication people in the artillery, so they switched me to artillery. Mm -hmm. And I went through the war in the artillery. And I went in as a private, and they came out as a master sergeant, which was the highest enlisted grade at the time, in 45. Then I got, uh, when I got back, to back up, when I got out in 41, we weren't in the war yet. Got out in May 41. In July 41, I went to Canada and joined the Canadian Army. Tried again to get in the infantry, but they put me in the Royal Canadian Corps of Signals. I served nine months up there. By this time, we're in the war. The U.S. is in the war. Mm -hmm. So they transferred me back to the U.S. And that's when I took infantry basic at Camp Trot. Okay, uh, just to go back at Fort Benning, Georgia, at jump school. So, how many people were there when you were? How many people were being trained with you? About twelve hundred started and eight hundred finished. So, what types of things did they teach you? Uh, mostly, uh, most of it very. Tough physically. Yeah, oh, I training was very yeah. tough physically. You toughened you up really good. Uh huh. And you went through uh, training, in, 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 or dealing with actually jumping. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of tumbling and toughening up mainly. Yeah. And an interesting bit of training that I think they eventually did away with were towers. They were 275 feet, I believe, and they put the parachute in a form and pull you up and release you. And you came down with the parachute, free shoot. And another one was they strap you in face down, horizontal, and pull you 150 feet, and then you had to pull a rip cord and a shock cord caught you mm -hmm. after you dropped and you'd whip around a little bit. And you had to count 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 after you pulled the cord. And you never say thousand, you say thousands, so you, thousands. So you don't bite your tongue. <laughs> uh, I think they did away with that too. But. The Parachute Communications course was, there were about 18 of us in it, one plane load. And the two jumps were on the Alabama side of the Chattahoochee River in Fort Benning. And there was a captain in charge of it, and I think he should have been cashiered for what he did. He made us jump bareheaded with low shoes, he says, that'll teach you to keep your head down and to land properly. Mm -hmm. Well, as a result, the D-rings, which attached the suspension cord, uh, when the chute opened, took people in the back of the head, so several people ended up with bloody oh. heads <laughs> and a few broken ankles and so forth because you only had no right. shoes on. But I didn't, I kept my head down and I landed properly. And so you never had any? Never got hurt. Wow. Hmm. Okay. Uh, where were you when you heard about the bombing of Pearl Harbor? I was laying in the Red Triangle Club, I was in the Canadian Army and a Sunday morning, and I heard it on the radio. And 
a friend of mine, and also an American in the Canadian Army, uh, was playing uh, volley, uh, tennis? a table game, table tennis, oh, okay. near me. So I says, uh, hey Gibby, the states are in it. When I heard it on the radio. Uh -huh. So that's when, several months later, they transferred us back to the U.S. Army. But that's where I was in the Red Triangle Club in, in Montreal, Canada at the time. So, and how, what, are the, what were the Canadians' reaction to this? Pardon? What were the Canadians' reaction to the bombing of Pearl Harbor? They were happy to get another ally, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, I would think. So when did you first come into combat and where? First taste of combat was going into Sicily where we got shot down by the U.S. Navy. Was it intense or? How was it? Pardon? Was it intense? <laughs> was the war intense when you were out there? Well, it was for a moment there after we got yeah. <laughs> shot at. <laughs> yeah. I wrote an account on that and stated that uh, there were 13 of us that jumped. The one on the end of the stick, the 13th, was a chaplain. And we had a lieutenant in charge. And we were standing up and hooked up and we had door loads, which were bulky radio packages. Mm -hmm to push out the door when we jumped. I was standing in the door, myself, the lieutenant, and another fella, ready to push the doors out, to load out. When we got the fire, both engines went dead in the plane, the C-47, by the way. Uh, the pilot held it, he got us over land, <coughs> and when we jumped, we didn't know where we were, we weren't where we were supposed to be, so we holed up. In the morning, I estimated we were in a square, two-acre yes, olive orchard, that, yeah. the 13 of us. None of us was a scratch, and the pilot and co-pilot were killed in the huh. crash. That was a very hairy jump, and I stated also that uh, we were strafed that morning. But we didn't see any ground fire that morning. Uh, was it hard to see casualties every day? Pardon? Was it hard to see casualties every day? Uh, you get used to it. You got used to it? Uh, if you don't, for instance, the lieutenant who was in charge of us, he disappeared after, after that. And we heard he had mental problems and we don't know whether it was the landing that jump that caused his mental problems or not, but we never saw him again. Uh -huh. Was there anyone else you were real close to that passed on, that you became real good buddies with in the Army, in the, in the service? Pardon? Were there, were there any other people that died who you became real close with while you were in service? Oh, definitely. Uh, yeah. Uh, my main buddy, so to speak, was Pip Haida. And our CO called us the two best <coughs> infantrymen in the, the artillery oh, yeah. because he'd always pick us for patrols and scouting. And huh. <laughs> um, so, that was, I, so that was tough. Just, uh, Cliff, we stayed in touch until he died in 1990-95 in Auburn, California. But he went on, we were both direct commissions, given direct commissions in uh, 1949. And he went on immediate active duty, and I was called back in 51 for Korea. Cliff uh, stayed in the Army and retired in 1967 as a lieutenant colonel, and he had received training 
in the Army. He got a master's in um, MBA, Master in Business Administration, courtesy of the Army. Mm -hmm. And uh, in early computer work. So he became a software engineer, so to speak. Much like Ken Jennings on uh, yeah. Jeopardy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so after he retired, he worked. He was in Belgium a few years. He was in England a few years, working in early computer stuff. And then he established his own business. Oh, he worked for uh, Texas Instruments in. Uh, in Texas for mm -hmm. uh, Austin for a few years. Then he went on his own selling software. Uh, and he died, as I said, in 1995. He was my main buddy, but we kept in touch, visited back and forth mm -hmm. all during that interim period from World War II until his death. Uh, 1943 seemed like a pretty busy year for you. I, I saw that you moved from Morocco to Sicily to Naples, and then finally to Northern Ireland over a period of only seven months. Uh, what was what was the reason for this? I mean, was that and was it hard for you moving from all these different places? Well, when you were aboard ship, uh, incidentally, in regard to the uh, trip. We left Naples in November 43 by ship. We didn't know where we were going. Uh -huh. I made two $20 bets that we were going to, we, we were sailing west, and I said, this is a faint. We're going to turn around, we're going to go into Greece. I found out later the only one agreed with me was Winston, Winston Churchill. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> We sailed out through Gibraltar, out in the Atlantic, and one, one day they announced, you're closer to the U.S. than you are Europe, but you're not going home. And then they turned around and they landed in Belfast, North Island. Uh, we stayed in Ireland for a couple of months, and then we moved to the Midlands of England, in a uh, town of... Or, uh, County Leicestershire, uh, Market Harborough was the name of the city. And we stayed there for the Normandy, and we returned there and stayed until we went into Holland under Operation Market Garden. Uh, did you have any specific missions when you dropped into Normandy on D-Day? I was in the middle of the stick, and my job was to release the equipment bundles as I went out. There were toggle switches strapped together, and I was to hit them mm -hmm. and release the bundles. However, in that jump, the pilot I guess in response to anti-aircraft fire, you got real high. We usually jump six to eight hundred feet in a combat jump, but we had to be at least fifteen hundred. Wow. Well, coming down, we received tracer fire was coming up, and it looked like you'd never make it to the ground alive. Mm -hmm. But I kept hurrying my descent by slipping back and forth. And as I got near the ground, it looked like a nice meadow. Mm -hmm. But when I hit, it was splash. They had, Jerry had flooded the Murderay River, closed the dam apparently, and flooded the floodplain of the river. So we landed in water of the Murderay River. And water was about chest high except for channels which were over your head. I had quite a time getting out of the chute. Ship 
took in some water. And I'm standing finally and I had an M1 and I'm trying to put it together. And I was a little out of it due to the water I took. Oh, yeah. And one of the fellows walked up and said, let me help you, Kate, and he slapped the rifle together for me. A few minutes later I was okay. And we moved out of there and we had landed about 2.15 in the morning, about four hours before they hit the beach. And come daybreak, we're going down a railroad bed. They ran through this swampy area near St. Mary Glees, uh, Normandy. And we got to a road. No more than got to the road, and along come a German motorcyclist. So I wasn't the only one that got him, but at a short range, I put about two of them in him, and some, so I'm sure several other guys did too. And that was our first encounter with the Jerry's, and the staff car was behind him. The staff car turned around and we sent fire after him. We don't know the results, but anyway, the car got away. And then we were with Colonel Lindquist, which was the 508 Parachute Infantry Regiment's CO. Had about 40 of us together. We tried to take a roadblock unsuccessfully because we didn't have any weapons. Everything was lost in the swamp. Any heavy weapons. All we had was our personal weapons. And we finally ended up in a perimeter where we had the division commander. Um, and the assistant division commander showed up there too with Gavin and Ridgeway with the, with the CG. There were about 90 of us in the perimeter. And it was, I guess, three days before we finally got hooked up as a division and the people from the beaches started coming into our area. It was a very messed up operation in that it didn't, hardly anybody landed where they were supposed to. But uh, maybe the blundering through that we did was on the plus side because it confused the Jerry's as much as it yeah, did us. That's right. Um, so when you originally dropped from 1,500 feet, you thought you thought they were going to get you? Thought you were going to die? Oh, I never thought I'd hit the ground on that really? that jump. Huh. Um, can you recall any specific missions you did in the Battle of the Bulge? Uh, it was very cold. Was it? Very cold. A lot of snow. <laughs> <coughs> One instance that sticks in my mind was uh, I almost killed my best friend, Cliff Ida. We were in this little village, and another fellow and I were out as a listening post about a mile, mile and a half out of town. And it was a moonlight night, snow on the ground. And I hear this crunch, 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 kind of. We're standing in this shadow from the moonlight. And uh, so I said to Isley, who was with me, I said, you hold up, ready to give me covering fire. And this is probably a, a Jerry Scout. And I'll wait till he gets point blank range and, and I'll get him. 
and you cover me for anything that's behind him. Well, I had my M1 on his chest, and I'm taking up the tension on the trigger when he says, kick! And it was my buddy come to relieve me about 2 a.m., and it shook me up the most of any I had been during the war. How wow. close I come to killing yeah. my best friend. Wow. But Jerry didn't come in, so that made us happy. <laughs> uh, where were you when the war in Europe ended? Uh, we were in Northern Europe. We had previously, just shortly before, crossed the Elbe River. Uh, Jerry had gave some resistance, and that's where I got a purple heart. I was slightly wounded, uh, trying to, but this time I'm communication chief. And I left the driver, Jeep driver, in a safe basement. And I took this Corporal Raby and I to repair a line which we used for fire direction at a road crossing. Well, Jerry was putting intermittent fire on the crossroad. So we had gotten out of the Jeep and working on the line and the shells started coming in. And just before one hit, made a direct hit on our Jeep, a two and a half ton truck pulled up between us. The fellow piled out and got in a ditch. So that's what saved our lives. Mm -hmm. our, it was this two and a half ton truck between us and the Jeep, and the Jeep got a direct hit. And we got clipped. Uh, he got clipped in the eyes and I got clipped. Still got a hard spot right there. Huh. Just missed my eye. So I was bleeding and he couldn't see. So I led him to safe place. And I just had a slight slight wound and it had bitched my my eye uh -huh. right there. It's a hard spot. Any other wounds or injuries that you have throughout the That's the only wound I got. Uh, huh. Very lucky. Wow. And his eyes uh, made it through too, so, oh, they, oh, wow. so he made it all right. So what were your thoughts when the war in Europe ended? Uh, I was happy to hear that the war was over and I had already been accepted in Syracuse oh. for college uh, by correspondence under the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. I was very happy to get home. I was married. I was married some eight days after I got discharged. I started college uh, I think it was a day or two late, but they accepted me anyway at Syracuse in 1945. Uh, after Germany was defeated, uh, many allies, Allied soldiers thought they would be moved to Japan. Uh, did you think this was possible for you at any moment in time? Pardon? Uh, did you, uh, after Germany was defeated, many of the Allied soldiers thought that they'd be maybe moved to Japan. Uh, did you think this was the case for you, too? Did you think you'd be moved to Japan to fight? In on, uh, see, I have a little trouble hearing. Yeah, um, well, after Germany was defeated, uh, many of the Allied soldiers thought that they'd be oh. moved to fight Japan. Did you, did you feel this way? Did you? No. Uh, after the war ended in Europe, they put the High Point men in the 17th Airborne Division for rotation back to the States. Mm -hmm. And uh, the point, people with lesser points stayed with the division, and they also took people from the 17th and put in the beep up the division and the 82nd Airborne went to Berlin after the war. 
as occupation forces. And we eventually got home. Uh, as I said, I landed in uh, Miami, Florida, August 21st, after starting July 5th to fly home. Mm -hmm. And was discharged August 27th. And got completely out of everything. Uh -huh. No reserve, nothing. Until 1947. Things were heating up in the Cold War. I did not want to go back in as a private again. So I enlisted in the reserves as a master sergeant. In 49, I received a direct appointment to second lieutenant. And in 51, I was back in the 82nd Airborne, recalled for Korea. So how, how did it feel when you were appointed directly to second lieutenant? I was an old second lieutenant. Old second lieutenant? <laughs> <laughs> 30, almost 32 years old when I was, when I was on active duty as a second lieutenant. Mm -hmm. And November, when I, October or November, I, I can never can remember which, 52, but this time I'm a first lieutenant, I left the division in July 52, and they sent me to in military intelligence school at Fort Riley, Kansas for, I think it was 12 weeks, and then I went to Yokohama, Japan, and eventually over to, to Korea. Uh, what specific missions did you do while in the 82nd Airborne Division, 319 Airborne, F Airborne Field Artillery Battalion? The 319th? Yeah. Uh, that is now, the 319th now is a regiment. Mm -hmm. And it, it is the artillery, one regiment of artillery. At that time, we did not have, uh, during World War II, we did not have artillery regiments. We had artillery battalions. With division artillery is the head of the, all the battalions, mm -hmm. which I was with in World War II, of course. And when I, when I went back in, in 50, 51, uh, it was, the 319th was still a battalion. It had been glider in World War II, but they made it parachute after World War II. So, it was uh, a parachute artillery battalion. Incidentally, probably the, one of the hairiest jumps I ever made was in Texas in the Longhorn Maneuver in, I think it was April 52. And I think it was the first heavy drop, mass drop, ever made. We dropped full-sized towed 105s with three 100-foot chutes. We dropped three-quarter ton trucks with three 100-foot chutes. And they were mounted on plank platforms. They slid out the back of the plane and they dropped the troops with it. Or other planes, of course. So the air was full of these heavy things coming down, mm -hmm. soldiers, <laughs> other equipment bundles. And the air was full of shards of wood and <laughs> planks. Uh, broke up several of the the heavy drop. The chutes broke loose, mm -hmm. and they streamed in. It was a very hairy jump. Well, I don't know how many were killed, but I'm sure some must have been in that drop in Texas. Yeah. And 
it was as bad as it got. Uh, so what did you do while you were in Korea? In Korea, I call it a cushy job. First I was in 10 Corps in the mountains, in general intelligence. Mm -hmm. And my main duty was to uh, put together an intelligence summary daily for the commanding general. But I had small one-day missions to the line for uh, various reasons. One was very interesting. Uh, they had a, a Turkish battalion, infantry battalion on the line. Now that was a UN operation, and they had people from Greece, Turkey, you name it, Britain, Canada, uh, almost all the UN countries sent people into Korea. Uh, what did you do after you retired from the service in 1980? Uh, by 1980, I had already retired from civil, U.S. federal civil service as a SAW scientist. And by 1980, I had been doing SAW survey contracting and consulting so when I retired from the military in 1980, when was the reserve retirement, age 60, uh, I had already been retired yeah. from civil service. Uh, I guess that's all I can say about that right now. Uh, so in retrospect, uh, what does all of this mean to you? Pardon? So, in retrospect, uh, what does all of this mean to you, everything that you've done for our country? Well, uh, one thing, the military has been real good to me. Oh, yeah. If you live through it, they treat you pretty well. They send me money every month. They send me to four years of college. Uh, I have a medical uh, TRICARE for Life, which is for free. Hmm. Practically for free. Yeah. It, it's uh, paid off real well. Once you get through the military and retire, as long as you're still alive, you do real well. Uh, so what would you say to some, anyone who's interested in joining the military today? The pay is much better than it used to be. The bonuses galore, we keep hearing about bonuses, bonuses, bonuses. Uh, it's nothing like it used to be. You operate on a shoestring, you didn't get much money. Yeah. Uh, and I think there are still educational benefits in the, for active duty in the military. Oh, yeah. Uh, a healthy young man or woman uh, who is willing to take a few chances mm -hmm. can do real well in the military, as long as they live through it. That's right. <laughs> okay. And that's everything.